uh, what we're going to talk about today is a package of training that um, we've been implementing for, I say we, I'm new to the team, but the team has been implementing for a few years. So I'm back. Hello. I'm Rosie. I'm our assistant behaviour support practitioner. I'm also fairly new to the team, so I've only delivered the training once and a half times. Um, but prior to that, I worked in a special needs school, so I've been in LP for about 10 years. What do we thought we'd do? Because it's quite a small group, so it might be interesting for us to hear about you and so who you are, where you're from, yeah. and I guess whether you practice or do any positive behaviour support, um, just so we can um, get, to, get to know you. I know Jenny, <laughs> so I'm going to think I'm Jenny first. <laughs> but you're okay to yeah, see so. I'm Jenny uh, and I am a media practitioner. Um, I work for Consensus Care, which is a private provider of residential support and media services, kind of Sussex, Surrey, Manchester, Wales, all over the place. So my patch is um, Surrey and Sussex, so as a practitioner, I go in the function assessments and create positive health support plans. Thank you. Okay. My name's Penny and I'm managing community learning and disability nurses across the Kent um, service in the community trust. Um, and I've recently brought in positive behaviour sport training for all my nurses and support workers in the team. Um, actually from South Bank, but um, so and that was um, uh, two full days, but with a work sh- work pack in between. So if, so this is kind of be quite interesting, yeah. Because the other thing I also have um, for Nurse practitioners who are particularly skilled in um, PBS or dentists are training and that sort of thing. So I've got them to do I'm going to do levels, you know, as to everybody should have the basics, and then I want to develop a system of expertise across the set of teams. Hi, um, I'm Jen, I'm a parent. Um, and I'm passionate about PBS, but my son's only had it real PBS for about past six months. Okay. But it's transformed his life. Um, but I'm also on the Surrey Positive Behaviour Support Network uh, as a founding chair, and I'm also on Jonathan Beebe's board. Um, so, yeah. So I want to promote yeah. for parents so they can ask the right questions and make sure they're giving the right support. Jane Phillips. Hello. I'm Jenny. Um, I'm a senior sport worker slash PBS coach for the Huntington Group. Excellent. Um, we've just like, sort of redeveloped our training for support workers and all the staff there. Um, and we're looking at extending it to so patients and families. Thank you. Uh, I'm also uh, the same senior house, I work for the Huntington Group. Um, I'm the fiscal intervention and management advisor there. Uh, um, and also being this coach, which is heavily linked into the training with that side of it as well. Um, and we've got a balance with the mental health and the community. It's good, you know, just through the yeah. art pair. So, yeah, excellent. There's lots of PBS knowledge in the group. If there's any mistakes, then yeah. that's the best of our knowledge. Thank you. I'm Alan Richard, I work for the Surrey County Council, uh, organising the training for their staff and for external people working out of social care. I'm Louise, I work with Richard, I'm a learning and development consultant working in um, training, learning and development opportunities for adult social care staff in Surrey. So PBS being a big part of that, um, uh, albeit a very awareness level. Um, but offering lots of other courses as well for um, care staff in the county. Excellent. That's interesting. Different take on things that we need to um, think about. Okay. Hi. Um, th- my name is Tanya. I work for um, in a positive behaviour support team in Croydon. Um, I'm a behaviour practitioner. I uh, work with people. Um, I work with uh, people with complex needs and adults. I work with adults at the moment. I do, not do a lot of work with parents of the people that we support as well. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Um, so I'm Agnieszka. I only started a couple of weeks ago with Health Education England. Oh, right. I'm okay. based at Crowley Hospital, um, supporting a number of programs, including uh, learning disabilities, and life care and cancer. So the reason for me to be here is just to call find out, learn, watch. Okay. Yes. So it's interesting um, 
experiences and understanding. So it would be helpful for us to sort of express what what, um, what we're doing down in Brighton. So what we're going to cover <coughs> are the origins. We'll have a bit of a recap about the origins of PBS. Um, some of the slides may be familiar to those who've done this all before. Um, but also thinking about the origins of the PBS package within uh, Brighton and Hove, and I can talk about a bit of the history just quickly. The specific aims of our training, so what are the aims um, that parents have, have uh, developed from the training? So what can they expect from doing our training? Um, we're going to look at the content, so we're going to go over the areas, but then we're going to have a look at some of the tools that we use. We do work for CAMS, so a lot of the tools are ones adapted for families and young people, so within schools. We'll talk about things like the Just Right program, and uh, we can uh, give you a bit more information about that, but, but we can talk about the frameworks that we use. And then we're going to have a look at the experiences from the parents who have been on the training and have, have given their feedback and also a bit of data about what impact has the training had on confidence and on, on knowledge as well. So we were quite interested in a bit of data around it. Uh, having gone through this sort of thing, that's probably why. And then also think about our future directions as, as well. Um, so the origins for, for us, I guess it was identified, identifying the needs that when families can kind of cope, there can be a huge impact on that individual, but then also on that family and that person's services as well, especially if there's subsequent need for support to be provided outside of the home. So we know that if, if there's difficulties within one situation, then it tends to feed into other uh, circles for that person in their life. So whether it be at school or then outside of the school in the community as well. And we know that if we get it wrong for that person, that family, then the journey for that person and that family can be very restrictive. <clears throat> I've worked in adult services, so my last job was working um, with a, uh, a CCG, so a clinical commissioning group, working specifically as part of the Transforming Care Programme. So working into assessing treatment units to try and support people to come out of those units. So I've seen what happens when we get it wrong. So another idea around this origin is to intervene early. It's a bit of a mantra in regards to positive behaviour support, but this is actually working with younger people, i.e. Uh, children. So it's response in recognition of the impact of challenging behaviour and the levels of stress families often experience. So um, you know, we have uh, referrals coming in to us, and some of them come from a school that are concerned, but, but uh, a lot of uh, referrals come from families themselves in dire need. Um, so it might be that their son or daughter isn't engaging in school, so any respite that a family received from their loved one going into school is gone because that child's been excluded or they're on a part-time, or working with lots of children who are on part-time timetables. And it doesn't help. It doesn't help in lots of, in lots of ways. The origin specifically of our training <coughs> came from, um, so um, Peter Baker uh, developed and John Shepherd, who worked over in Hastings at that point, um, they developed a positive behaviour support training package for, um, for care homes. So they worked with adult provider services. But it was identified that it would be really helpful to develop a package for parents. The benefits of that are that we tend to start talking the same language to describe behaviours. We start using the same tools. So I'm now getting the benefits or parents having worked, who parents having previously gone on the training, because they're already showing me ABC charts, they've already got a behaviour support plan, because they developed it themselves, it makes my work a lot easier. And we have a very sophisticated conversation about challenging behaviour. So it's developed, um, so this, this program package that we do is developed in East Sussex by Peter Baker and Rosie Singh. Um, Rosie <coughs> Singh is a um, What's Rosie's background? I think she speaks in language, which Yeah. originally, and then she set up the 
um, what we call the FIS team, which is a Camdale D team, but it's a family intense support service, I think. So they call themselves the FIS team. So she, her and Vicky Baker, I believe, set up that service, and she's since then just gone up the ranks. <laughs> So, so it came from um, some key clinicians identifying the need, and then it was adopted in Brighton Home in 2015. And in Brighton Home, it's got a bit of a different flavour because it's more of a collaboration between um, CAMS, so NHS, schools. So we link in with the head teacher of uh, special education the school, and then also with social care. So we'll talk a bit about social care have um, freed up some direct payments to help uh, parents to come along. So there's that sort of partnership working that's really helped. So a combination one, the schools um, often have really good links with families because of the nature of the schooling system. They also uh, have a venue for us to use. Um, the social care element in the social services are looking at being creative with the direct payment system so the parents can be uh, can come along to, to our training and then from our point of view as CAMS LD it's a link in with those with the families with the young person and with their networks as well so it's quite interesting in, in that level um, right what is positive behaviour support I can't remember where I copied this from <laughs> it may be Challenge and Behaviour Foundation so thank you <laughs> It may be build, like, thank them. It could be Tissal. It's a bit tiny in there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> There's one, you know, this is something that is, is out there. I think it is from the Change of Behaviour Foundation, one of the crib sheets around what is possible for you support. And uh, it's a really helpful uh, repository for lots of information. So, you know, um, go, go to the Change of Behaviour Foundation website. So, <clears throat> what is possible? Sorry. <laughs> and that's the nature of this work, you know. It is, uh, yeah, so I know some of the people who help to you know, do things as well, you know, so it's all that lovely collaborative work. So <clears throat> it's based upon that principle that if we can teach someone more effective and more accessible behaviour than the challenging one, then the challenge behaviour will reduce. That's a, one of the premises, okay. So it teaches alternative behaviour, changes the environment to sort, support the person. Uh, well, helps people to get the life they need by increasing the number of ways of achieving these things, for example, developing communication skills, and it helps people to learn new skills. It's that constructive idea. For new skills to be used regularly, they have to be more effective than the change of behaviour. So we can make this happen by understanding the reasons why people display change of behaviour. So that's the functional assessment of that behaviour. So why is this behaviour occurring? What's, what makes it more likely? What are the triggers for that? What does it look like? And then what can we do? What, what, what's, what's the person trying to indicate to us? What aren't we understanding? Um, and by making sure that new behaviours we want to teach are reinforced. There's no point a person learning a new skill if that's not uh, recognised by those around that person. So you know, I've worked in services where someone has a learnt Makaton, but they're in a service where nobody uses Makaton or thinks that that person doesn't know Makaton. And then suddenly a new person comes into that person's life and signs good morning or toilet. And suddenly a whole vocabulary is established just because actually that person has learnt those skills, it's just that they're not reinforced in this environment. So, so you know, it's that, that sort of uh, thought. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Rosie about the aims. So for the, for the course that we've uh, adopted from the FIS team, um, the aim for us is to help, and help parents understand why challenging behaviour occurs. Um, I think it also helps parents when they're thinking about introducing their child to someone new or going to a, a new setting or a new environment that you know, their child's reacting in that way for a reason they're not naughty and for lots of people surrounding them they may look at their child as their you know, bad parenting or a naughty child. Um, and then we talk about helping the children and the young people get their needs met in ways that are more appropriate. Um, to intervene effectively when challenging behaviour occurs, um, talking about keeping safe, teaching skills, and um, to meet and learn from parents who are in similar situations. 
the, the last aim is really lovely. We have, usually we have the group of parents who come, especially this, the last two um, this year, they come about half an hour early and they sit and have a coffee together and quite often as we're leaving we leave all the rooms open for them and they'll sit and they'll catch up and they will exchange numbers and the summer holidays coming up they feel like they've got a little network built up around them now which is lovely. So the content of the course are these headings. So we started with session one with them, the parents introducing their own child in a positive way, they pick a really positive thing about their child and they discuss it with the other people. Some, depending on how uh, communicative the group is, we might ask them to pair up with someone they don't know and they introduce each other's children. Um, and we talk about why we run the course. And most, the biggest reason for me, and I think the biggest impact for parents, is that all of these courses are run for professionals, yet parents are the ones that have their children for the longest period of time and actually are the experts in their children. Uh, we discuss what PBS is and then we look at how a behaviour support plan should be written and how they could be effectively used and we look at the proactive strategies, active strategies and reactive strategies. We use um, a behaviour support plan that's based on the Just Right system which is, it's, has anyone heard of zones of regulation? So it's like a traffic light system. So. We use blue, green, orange and red, with red being um, in crisis and blue being sort of under aroused. So we talk about if they're in the blue, they're under aroused, sleepy or chilled. For home, I think, it's usually okay if they're in the blue, but if you want to take them out, get them off to school, then we talk about how you can get them more alert. The green is when they're... Lots of, lots of schools use the phrase calm and green. Are you calm and green? Is this how you can be calm and green? So, and it's sort of a shared language across all four special schools and the two residential units there. And, and then orange is excited, busy, hyper, sort of going up to, you know, you want to catch them, bring them back down before they hit the red sort of thing. And then red is our crisis behaviours. Um, and that's obviously where we talk about more the reactive strategies and just doing what you can to maintain safety in the situation. And we also go into what a recovery phase would look like for the child and how you could do relationship repair um, and yeah, and to repair relationships with other people and how the children may, may react differently after crisis. Um, we talk about the behaviour cycle, so... Uh, when we're aiming for a baseline of green, but how the behaviour can go up to the orange, and if it's not brought back down, they might go up to the red, and then once they're in the red, they may come down to the orange, which can then flip them back up into the red. So we sort of talk about all the different strategies um, and presentations of behaviour, and then we get the parents to fill in the green section of the behaviour support plan, which tends to be where parents find it most tricky because they do lots of things instinctively to keep their child calm. They don't say things, they do say things, they look at them in certain ways, um, and it just makes them really think about the stuff that they are always doing, and it's quite a positive start because it's, it, it shows them that they are uh, very intuitive with their children and they are experts in their children. And for session two, we talk about what challenging behaviour is for them because obviously it can be different for each person. Um, and then we do something on mismatches of the environment and their individual factors. So we get the parents sort of list um, what is important to their child, uh, be it emotional needs, physical needs, uh, communication needs, and then talk about the environment. So um, sense, the sensory environment, the immediate environment, people around them, the organisation of the environment, do they know what they're doing? And then the challenging behaviours that may occur if these environments are mismatched. I think that's what they know as well. Um, we obviously talk about goals for the course, um, board, board goals. So lots of parents come and majority of them want to be out in the community more frequently than they are. So we set that as a long-term goal and then they have a short-term goal. So recently a parent has decided that she would like her daughter to access the community more and they'd like to go out for dinner as a family. So they have started off with going to a bakery, so what she points out she gets immediately. She then went to McDonald's because it's slightly on the waiting time but not too much. And she's eventually built it up to Pizza Express and then she wants to move on to restaurants but she's she's just found it all so exciting that you know her daughter sat at McDonald's. She rang me actually on New she texted me on New Year's Day 
so excited that she managed it. Um, and then we talk them through ABCs and how, how to record using ABCs. In session three, we talk about helpful recording um, and that it's very easy to get caught up in um, your emotions around the behaviour. So when you're recording for professionals, it's quite easy to say um, they were cross uh, because they wanted their own way. So for other people looking at that, you can say, okay, well, how do you know they were cross? What did they want? How do you know they wanted that? Um, so we sort of unpick how best to record as a, an, almost as an outsider, so standing back and not having emotional attachment with things, which is easier said than done for parents. Um, and we talk about the, the four functions of behaviour so they get a bit more of an understanding of what they're looking at when they're recording. Um, in session four, we look back on the ABCs and talk about spotting patterns. So I think that's down as being a detective, um, just to get parents more in the frame, uh, the sort of the frame of mind of looking at behaviours in an ABC format, so they can get a better understanding and try not to get so caught up in it and try and be more um, more of a detective and look at the functions. And then from the ABC recordings, we get them to go. We look through them and see where there's patterns of where it's most likely to happen, least likely to happen, whether there's people, whether there's environments, um, so they can sort of build a bigger picture for these, uh, for the triggers of behaviour, whether actually it's environment, whether it's people, whether it's internal triggers. And session five, we look at well-being for both the young person and the families, and I in fact did the session yesterday, and it's it's lovely because it gets all the parents talking about the support that they get, don't get, could get, how they could get the extra support, what things are out there. Brighton Home are really good with parent voice. We've got quite a lot of groups and quite a lot of, um, I think we've got several parents who are very up there with all the Facebook groups and they, everybody communicates and it's, it's really lovely to get them all talking. We also look at the orange part of the behaviour support plan um, and what skills teaching could be uh, introduced so that we can uh, list, make the crisis behaviours less likely. In session six we do the blue section but we also look at waiting, uh, waiting skills, teaching waiting skills which is always a huge one, self-occupying skills, finishing activities because that's been also one that's huge and then life skills that they can learn just very uh, very, you know, be it just picking up their toothbrush when they're brushing their teeth and then having the support after there. So we talk a lot about, although sometimes it's easier to do uh, a lot of the life skills stuff for them, we're then taking away that choice and independence and so we talk about the importance of that um, and building up a bit more of a repertoire and a bit more of independence. Um, session seven, we do a bit more about keeping safe. Um, Marina, who's the deputy head um, at the special school who runs it with us, is actually a skip trainer, so she kind of brings all that sort of um, uh, behaviour management stuff in, and she does a, a very, very simple um, session on keeping safe, and we talk about verbal and non-verbal techniques, um, and, do, and then we talk about all the red reactive strategies that could be included. We do a whole session on communication and we do a whole session on sensory because the Just Right programme was actually um, developed by an OT within Brighton who was sensory attachment trained. So she has developed it, it's now citywide across um, mainstream schools as well. So she does, although it was originally developed for uh, sensory integration and sort of building and incorporating sensory diets, because she's now sensory attachment trained, she's realised that actually it's incredibly important to have that for emotional regulation reasons and for behaviour. Um, when I first joined the team, I wasn't sure that actually the SLD kids would be able to pick up on this sort of colour system, but it, they seem to all actually do really well with it. I worked with a five-year-old and his first words was red and when he was cross, he now shouts red. So he's recognised that somewhere along the line, um, even though we weren't sure that he would be able to. Um, but it's really useful that that is citywide and it's used within all the settings because parents with mainstream children can use the same language to support their child with um, with LD as well. So it's yeah, it's been very successful, I think. And it also gives a parent ownership of a behaviour support plan which can be shared across 
family, PAs, school, sort of all around. So this is our just right system. Does, does anybody have any questions? Uh, <coughs> so I've just bombarded a whole list of things. <laughs> Clearly, having the same system of colour coding and, and, um, and what those each colour code means across a variety of agencies is really useful because yeah. we're terrible about developing new ones in each individual service. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is, and also it it gives um, it it enables the children to take ownership of it a bit more, and you can create visual supports around the traffic light systems and the symbols can be bordered on the colour. Yeah, yeah. So you know you can yeah, say I can already you think about you have got lots yeah. of signs and symbols with appropriate. Yeah, yeah you know. Well, I can, the Marina always says, well, I can see you're a bit in the orange and she mm-hmm. you know she'll present the choice of um, yeah. orange symbols to bring them back down. It, it's, it's more difficult to do when in the red because lots of the children that's you know that's it. Their communication skills are gone um, and it's more about Sort of bringing them back to the level of being able to then get into the orange and then make a bit more of a choice, but it is very useful. Before we get the feedback, is there any other questions about that? Okay, so um, since 2015, so in 2000, so in 2015, 12 parents came on the course, nine in 2016. 18 in 2017 and currently uh, 10 this year. We've um, uh, tried to, uh, the team have presented the training at different times of the day, so sometimes during school hours, sometimes it's not at night, t- uh, in the evening as well, just so that because some of the feedback has been, we'd love to, but we can't. So it's trying to be flexible in relation to that. Um, and, and also we've tried to target people on our, uh, on our CAMs, so families that we're working with, but actually um, we've got good response from um, families who we know nothing about as well, so it's, it's quite nice to, to, to meet, meet those families as well. And to be aware of the need out there as well as really key. So those are the, uh, the, the numbers. Um, experiences. So this is the uh, pre and post stuff around uh, parental stress scale. So this is a questionnaire that families complete to begin with and then at the end. So um, is it t- 10 week, um, mm-hmm. 10 sessions is the course. So it can be quite, so they're quite content. And but it's nine sessions with an optional sleep one. <laughs> <laughs> sleep is a big area. <laughs> So, um, so interestingly, on this scale that was used comparing the pre and post, stress levels using that tool reduced. Be mindful of of extrapolating too much out of that, because we know that that was at the end of the course. We don't, we haven't had a follow up uh, to check in there. So we need to be mindful of that. And the numbers involved as well, we need to be mindful of that. It's not a huge population of, of participants. And, and also, you know, people, uh, uh, you know, there can be that momentum around that oh, as well. Oh, you're going to put a follow up. Well, we, uh, we're going yeah. on to next directions, but um, uh, the future, future thoughts about our work. And it is that sort of, what impact is it having? We're still getting, and it's interesting as a new person, because I, I uh, so I meet families who have been on the training and they don't know that I know the, uh, the training and it's been interesting to hear them talk about it and talk about it to other families as well so through uh, Rosie's talked about the uh, parent voice groups and just hearing feedback from, from, from them as well but it would be interesting to, to look at that sort of thing is it helping? You know, um, there's other benefits like Rosie says there's other benefits of doing the training is that gives the parents an opportunity just to meet together, you know, and just to talk and have a coffee, if that, you know, and that, that's helpful in itself and value to activity. We've got a group of, a couple of parents in this group that we're running at the moment who are single mums, and uh, we, yesterday we were talking about a really good strategy across settings is often change of face, 
And they were saying, oh, now they've got each other's numbers, they'll FaceTime each other, just so they've got a bit of change of face if someone else can say it to them. But it was just, it was really nice that they were coming up with ideas to support each other a bit more. So the other um, thing that we were interested in is family quality of life. So again, there's lots of measures about quality of life. This one's a family one. It's a bit of an American flame tool, so it talks about uh, some of the words are quite American. But family quality of life in that snapshot that we took um, to improve. But it is, I guess, you know, the other thing about PBS is that thought that is what you're doing improving the situation? If it's not, stop. Can you do what you're doing in the central aisle of Tesco's? Does it look okay? You know, these are the mantras, these are the mantras. If you were on the receiving end of these interventions, would it feel okay to you? If it is for all those, then you're on to a bit of a winner, okay? So that's the sort of, um, uh, I guess, the data bit. And then experiences-wise, so it's great and I've been recommending it to, to other parents. The nature of our children's needs means that suitable, <laughs> finding suitable babysitters is almost impossible. So those parents of children whose behaviour is frequent, intense, um, uh, and, and the most uh, uh, causing of concern, it can be difficult for those parents to just leave their child with someone else for a period of time, for, for nine, ten weeks. So um, we do need to think, still think, how to be, how do we, how can we creatively support people who need to, who who would like to come on our training, to come on our training. Um, it was brilliant, it, it really helped us. So we have nice anecdotal uh, feedback, but we would, wouldn't we? Because <laughs> we're gathering, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so future directions, um, increased number of courses, you know, there, there's a demand around that. Uh, recruit parent trainer, well, we've got schools, we've got uh, social care, we've got NHS. It would be nice to have some parents doing the training as well. And develop refresher courses. I'll add on for the next presentation, I'll add on your point about that follow up stuff. But, but I guess that's that sort of refresher in adult services, in, in paid services, uh, staff get refresher training, staff get this, that, and the other. So the parents might not have access to that. So, how do we, how do we include them in that sort of process as well? Okay, linking the SEND hubs, that's the, uh, say SEND, special education need in Brighton, they're from this, uh, at the end of this term, the special education need schools are joining up into these hubs. So there's one for the east side, if that's east, or if that's west, one for the west side, one central. And uh, there might be an opportunity, because it's pooling community resources, that we could link into that, that hub. So it might be a ready-made audience to link in with. So there's some opportunities that we're quite interested in. And then also sort of developing this, um, this direct payment option for families. But it can be difficult. A lot of the families that we work with are allocated sort of three hours support a week. You try and find a member of staff for three, uh, as a worker for three hours a week, um, it's really difficult. You know, it's really hard, you know, it's, it's, uh, it can be tricky, unless there's a family member who, who, who is available. Um, so it's thinking about how, how, do we, how do we move on? We're, we're happy with how things are, but it would be good to sort of, um, think about doing it for the future. That is the last slide. <laughs> Would anybody, has anybody got any? Does it? Are there? I guess we, yeah, we work from camps. Um, but is there any sort of similar things within your areas, organisations, or what are your thoughts? Have you got any questions? Well, we've got, I mean, my practitioners who are particularly experienced in PBS do do um, care staff training around one individual, but they do the PBS training for the whole team, particularly the values, yeah. um, because in, in paid services, it's all this control stuff that goes on, isn't it? And not being able to stand in the person's shoes and so on, but they need to, you know, be encouraged to think around. So, so we do that. So if we don't do families, then well, we haven't talked about it. But it just so happens that people have been referred in and been in and paid services probably because of the nature of the issues they have. Yeah. And, so, and they're adults, we don't work with children. Um, so I wanted to ask, can I just, I wanted to ask you. <laughs> I mean, 
the, the only thing that, when we've had these conversations, that sort of like worries me slightly is that if we went to a family, because we haven't had this conversation, and said, well, Would you like us to give, a, give you some PBS training? What do you think the response might be? I'm not want to see what it was. Yeah. And it could actually help. Um, yeah, some parents will jump with it. Some will say, oh, I don't need something else yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I can't cope with anything else. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, so the question is feeling on where you I think a lot of our parents who don't come on the course, I think they utilise the time with the children at school as their respite and they just just yes. don't have capacity to come and think really intensely about things that have happened. Mm. Um, so we quite often go and sort of deliver more one-to-one stuff within the home. Um, so there's not that sort of pressure of they have to do loads of the you know loads of the thinking. We kind of do it together in a different way, and they're not. I think lots of the, lots of parents have had experiences of going to a triple P that they run in Brighton Home Parenting um, Group, which isn't LD or SEN specific. Um, so I think they have had lots of experience of going to these parenting groups taking all the information on board and it's still not working for their child and then feeling quite negative about their own skills. So there's still a fair few parents in our caseload that would really benefit from coming, but it's just at the moment they don't really have the capacity or, you know, they're just not in place to do it yet. So I think there'll be there's a couple that we do it sort of one-to-one with and then encourage them over the years to maybe sit on a couple. Um, I've taken one of my parents to the course this time round because getting the bus and everything was just an added stress and she's actually really enjoyed it but that actually getting the bus and getting there and just stepping in the building was such a big step and now she's overcome it, she's really enjoying it but it is difficult. Um, recently, because I'm just finishing up the TISA for a few years, we were talking quite a lot about early intervention and it was about, they talked quite a lot about catching the parents at the right time yeah. because if it's too close to when they've just got the diagnosis. And mm-hmm. So it's, how do you find that? Because that must be quite difficult really. Like, they've got to be ready. You know, well, yeah, yeah, I think at the moment we can't, we recommend or we we either recommend to them or we'll say, oh, we've got this course running and just post them fly over alongside mm-hmm. everything else. So it's kind of pressure off and they can choose themselves whether they come. Mm-hmm. Quite often schools recommend um, you know, parent, it's, it is difficult and I, yeah. you, some parents just aren't ready. We've had a couple this time who've come to one or two and it's just too soon for them and mm-hmm. they've, they've dropped out and I'm sure we'll see them in the next few years when they're, they're ready for it. There is, and there are, so with, um, so we're part of a team that's I guess involved with people um, gaining that um, diagnosis around autism, mm-hmm. and then often parents are bombarded with stuff about autism, and um, and some people are you know, wanting at that point. Others actually we need to recalibrate our, our world, and you know, and maybe need a bit of time. So mm-hmm. it could be early intervention in the sense. Uh, it's available when, when people need it. I guess that's what we need to make sure yeah. that, that we keep an open door um, for, for things. Yeah. Okay. And so this is a rolling program, obviously. Yeah. So how long has it been rolled for? <laughs> what? How many years do you yeah. mean? Yeah, yeah. I think it's they've adopted it in our trust since 2015, but I think before then it was two or three years prior to that. Okay. Um, but the East Sussex team who developed it were all speech and language therapists, so it was very communication heavy, which was fantastic. Um, but it's been sort of adapted by our team um, for more sort of behaviour stuff, but we've kept in the communication stuff as well. We've also added in the sensory elements um, on top of it. But yeah, yeah, so I think... What are we in now? Yeah, it must be about six years, I think. Okay. And the East Sussex team still run it as well. I think it's brilliant, it should be everywhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but can I just ask the figures you've got on reducing parent stress and yeah. increasing policy of life? Did, in your questionnaire, did you actually say why? No. So it just can't, it was just a game at that point. So they don't understand their behaviour. So they're teasing. I guess in the, in the, in the separate evaluations, we get which area of the course um, had highest impact for you, so we used survey on key to pull out information.
information about which bits of the course was most pertinent for you, which bits were not helpful, so we can sort of think about what we're producing. So it's captured elsewhere, but not relating to directly to those quality of life or stress questions, but that again could be interesting. It would be interesting to, to think about. We ask all the parents before they come on the course to fill out a bit of information about their child as well and the challenges that they're facing so that we can make sure we're definitely including things that are um, going to be appropriate for them um, and sort of addressing their most challenging need at the time as well as focusing on the positives. So we do lots of, you know, ABCs and recording the behaviours that challenge, but we also um, ask them to go away and fill in a happiness ABC. So every time their child's happy or, you know, excited, they've done something great, we ask them to record that as well, so they've got a bit of a, um, a more positive spin on everything. So do you guys cover, what area do you cover? Brighton High School, Brighton High School. So... Army yeah, but uh, do you know what's the equivalent of you? So in East Sussex, there's um, so I guess it's all of East Sussex that is yeah, covered. So which do. is you know quite a big area. Um, so that's the FIS team, the um, family intensive support service. So and so that's children again, isn't it? Children, so, yeah. so it's parents of children, mm -hmm. isn't it? So, I don't think it's amazing as a kid. Not that I know of, it's amazingly sometimes published what I know about what goes on sometimes, you know. And I don't know. It is as in Kent as well, there isn't anything like this from the local teams. Yeah, it is, I would have been saying, so far. Yeah. I don't know, I guess, yeah, I don't know. We're, bright, we're quite lucky in certain, ge for geographical reasons, in Brighton and Hollywood. So, um, I think you've got the network of the schools as yeah, well, yeah. which. Yeah, our yeah. schools don't network. They're, they're not. They're not at all talking to one another. No, 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 no,
who can fill it and you know if, if there's um, ways of of implementing uh, packages. I think that definitely the first point of contact would be to develop a network of between the schools and asking like the children or the diagnosed autistic what sort of support do you provide mm -hmm. to your parents. And we know that um, we need to work harder around uh, autism, you know, the the, um, the the bill that was put in place around autism hasn't had the impact that these people wanted. So we do need to think about, we're looking at our pathways for people, because there's still people who fall um, outside of the, of the net um, and who are passed from pillar to post, um, you know, where services are, well, what flavour of this need have you got? And, oh, we don't work with people um, with that presentation. So, you know, there's still lots of barriers. And I guess in this world of financial um, uh, austerity, um, it can be, um, some services have been cut. I guess I'm just trying to find out you know, what is the local offer, and then I guess it's uh, linking, uh, finding out from Challenge Behaviour Foundation, you know, they're very helpful builds. You know, there's all these networks out there that are good hearts of information, and they may not know the answer, but they might know someone who might know the answer to make or ask those all questions as well. I think just because recently I've been working for the CCG for, for three years and I left, but in the current climate, I know that there's five CCGs that merge where Brighton and Hope is one of them. So it's Brighton and Hope, Highwell, Lewis and Hayes, Fortune and Sussex, Crowley and Surrey. So they all created some sort of an alliance where I guess, you know, this sort of information could be easily promoted because mm -hmm. each of those regions has got their communications and engagement team and they do a bit of a community to promote any activities they sponsor by or whatever, so that would be interesting. We've been involved with, they suggest you said that, I've been involved with, um, so East and West, um, uh, East Sussex, West Sussex and Brighton Home, been involved with a network that the CCGs are putting people together to just share how things are done in each of those areas and pick up on good practice or mm -hmm. pick up on ideas and, uh, and just to have that sort of share. We may not be all the same, we may not, we may not have to provide the same <coughs> standard service, but there might be bits that would be yeah. helpful to, to think about. So hopefully that work yeah. will be happening. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks for all your... Is there any other questions before we close? I think it's refreshment time. But thank you very much. Thanks for all your questions as well. Thank you. Yes. <laughs>